Hello everyone, you're very welcome to another printer build episode. This is episode six and things are coming along nicely, slowly, but nicely. In the last video, we talked about adding the Sherpa Mini with the Bamboo Lab A1 hot end and using the BTT Pi to host Clipper. Since then, we have added our 184 millimeter heated bed. This is a Bamboo Lab A1 Mini bed, but we've also made some little changes as well. So the Z rods for the bed are spaced a little wider this means more stability but also i've gotten rid of the top mounts for these and integrated these into the rear idler mounts as well so we don't have to print anything extra we have redesigned the bed mount to fit the new one and we've also designed a tensioner at the back of the printer for the belts which is also integrated to fit a 608 zz bearing to hold the lead screw nicely and securely there are concerns though the problems are not really with the components that we're using they're with my design Let's take a look at the bed mount. So at the back, we have our LM8UU bearings. Now these are great. They're cheap, they perform well, and they're very easy to design around. You could also use linear rails, but there is a price concern. These bearings are five euro in the shop and the rods can cost like 10 euro for a pair. Decent linear rails will probably cost you twice as much, maybe a little less, maybe. Now cantilever designs are obviously not as stable as something that you might see in a larger printer like an X1 or a K1. These usually go for a three lead screw and three rod approach. The problem that I'm having here is that with a cantilever design, all of the weight and force goes on one side. So that needs to be quite strong and rigid. And my design does not account for this. So there is a problem where the actual screws go into the profile that is supporting the bed. And that needes to be reinforced quite a bit. Cantilevers are exactly what they sound like. They're basically levers. And this is a 180 millimeter bed. It's a lot larger than say a B0, which has a 120 millimeter bed. You can get away with a cantilever for that. This one, I'm just hoping we can. If we can't, if we have problems with stability, then what I can do is I can add more rods on the front just here and here, and that will support everything, and it should be really nice and stable. I really want to go for the cantilever design just to reduce cost, but we'll see. Okay, next up are the tensioners that we've designed. So as I've said before, I hate that tensioners are often integrated into the motor mounts for printers. I find this very irritating. I want it to be simple. I want it to be easy to disassemble without affecting other parts. So what we've done is we've put the tensioners at the back, integrated it into the 608ZZ bearing holder. And if you're disassembling it, then you don't actually need to remove the bearing or the lead screw or anything like that. Uh, the fact that this is at the back and right between the idlers on each side gives it a bit more stability because it's another anchor point for the belt. This is a small printer, but still extra stability. Why not? Now, the design you see right here is not what I intend as a finished design. It's actually just a cutaway version. It is basically sliding contacts which house our flange bearings, and these are attached with a screw that can move them back and forth as you turn the screw, tensing each belt as you wish. A big problem that I have right now is the bulkiness of some of these parts. Most of them are larger than what they need to be, and if I keep the current scale of these, then I will actually be losing build space because there's just not enough room for the print head to move around. It's, it's colliding with things. So a lot of these need to be redesigned and miniaturized. In fact, with the tensioner, I'm thinking of reversing it entirely so that the thumb screws can go on the very back, giving more space in the chamber. I'm actually also thinking of losing the springs and using TPU standoffs for this instead. Right now, the print head is in total provisional status. Last time I spoke about how challenging a pretty print head is. I stand by this. Uh, someone in the comments actually suggested using the uh, Reaper tool head, which looks really nice. I'm not entirely sure about the 5015 fans, but that can be modded. So the Reaper is, is an option right now. Despite the print head not being complete, the printer is ready enough to check clipper connectivity. Uh, last time we actually did a motion test, but that was with Marlin. I just wanted to see the potential of it. But this time we are actually ready to do a motion test with Clipper. But first we need to work on the CFG. So in the last video, we installed Clipper, put it on the Pi, set up the main board for it, but we just left the CFG as default. Now we can start writing that CFG and matching up the components to make our firmware so that we have enough to do a basic test. 
So here it is. And yes, we have this error as mentioned at the end of our last video. This means we haven't added any thermistors for our bed and hot end. So let's just plug them in and restart. Well, hey, we're good. But now we have the missing parts from our configuration. So we got virtual SD card, pause resume, G code macros and display status. And we also have something that says mainsail.cfg is not in the printer CFG. Yeah, we installed mainsail, but we didn't actually define it in our CFG. So the only thing we got to do here is to go to our CFG and include this by simply adding include mainsail.cfg. Now we can save and restart. We go back to our dashboard and boom, error is gone. The include command simply imports lines from another file, this being mainsail.cfg. We could literally take all of those lines and write them in the printer.cfg, but this would be really messy and really, really long. So having the include function is great to keep your CFG quite tidy. Okay, we're good. Let's look at the CFG again. Most of what we need is already there because in the last video, we imported the default CFG for this board. For the steppers, we don't really need to worry about the pins. They're all done. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering what this guy is with the exclamation point, that just means the pin is inverted. It's pretty confusing when you're new to this, but easy to understand. Let's look at the micro steps. Micro stepping is how the firmware controls incremental movements in the stepper motors. The higher this number, the more steps that is possible for your motor to move. Contrary to some belief, this does not make your printer more accurate. It just makes it smoother. The default value is 16, but it can go higher. For us, we're just going to leave it at 16 for the minute. Rotation distance is how the firmware knows how many steps it takes to move the printhead a certain distance. And this depends on the pulley and belt profile that you're using. For us, we're using a 20 tooth pulley with a 2GT belt profile. So in this case, and for a lot of printers, this is kind of the standard, 40 is totally fine. However, the rotation distance will also depend on the motor you're using, specifically how many steps that motor needs to turn to get a full rotation, but also the micro stepping value you chose for that motor. If we go down to stepper Z, we can see it is different because we're not using a pulley, we're using a lead screw for motion. And we're using a T8 lead screw with a four start. Now that means there are four individual threads on the lead screw. So for this, eight is totally fine. And for most people, eight is gonna be the standard. If you have a different pulley, belt, or lead screw configuration, the Clipper website has great info on determining the correct values. Position end stop is exactly what it sounds like. Where is the physical position of your end stop on the printer? Zero is default, but maybe there is a gap between where the printhead homes and the minimum position on the bed on that particular axis. Position max is the furthest distance that you can command the printer to move on a certain axis. Positioning and homing is a little bit complicated because we need a printhead with the right dimensions in order to make this happen. We also need to test the printer physically in order to get the right values. So in terms of positioning and homing values on the CFG, we're going to leave this for now, because in addition to that, we also need to know uh, what we're going to do for senseless homing and the probe offsets for our Z leveling probe. So positioning and homing, we're going to leave for another time. The last thing for steppers for the minute is something that is actually missing from this default CFG, and that is full steps per rotation. This depends on the motor you use. Most motors have a 1.8 degree step, and these motors can move 200 steps in a full rotation. Makes sense. You might, however, be using a 0 0.9 degree stepper, in which case 400 steps is a full rotation. For us, we're using 1.8, so it's 200. You can apply similar definitions to the Y and Z stepper too. We are now going to scroll down to the TMC configurations and everything here is commented, so not read by the firmware. I am going to copy the first one here and bring it up to the stepper definitions and uncomment. We are using TMC 2209s on this printer, so this is perfect. Your pins should be fine here, but we also have a run current and stealth chop threshold. So run current is how much current your motor will use when moving. Again, this depends on the motor and the driver you're using. We're using pretty standard motors and the 2209s are pretty standard too. So between 0.5 and 0.8 is okay. But this requires testing. You don't want your motors running too hot and you don't want them underpowered as well. When we do have a printhead and we actually have some mass to move around on the printer, then we can tune this to the right current value. 
Stealth Chop has a weird value. That just means it is selected. Stealth Chop is a feature available to lots of drivers. It's basically quiet mode. If you want to keep it on, then just keep that value. But if you want to turn it off and use something else called Spread Cycle, just turn that value to zero. Speaking of Spread Cycle, it does offer a interpolate function, which reduces the noise on motors. However, it's not really as good as Stealth Chop apparently, so we're not going to use Spread Cycle for this printer. You can also add the definition hold underscore current, which is the current used when the motors are active but not moving. This is relevant for pauses. You want to keep it a bit lower than your run current so the motor can keep its position securely. You can then copy and paste the TMC stepper Y and Z like we did with X and adjust where necessary. Y will be the same, but for Z the current will be different. We're using a small Z motor and just one, so we're limiting the current. Of course, this depends on what motor and driver you're using, but it also depends on how you have set up your motor connection to the main board. You might have one stepper driver controlling two motors with a split connection, in which case you would need to increase the current so that both motors get enough power. Or you might have two independently run motors, each using their own driver. If this is the case, then you need to define a second Z stepper and driver in your CFG. Luckily, we're keeping things very simple with just one motor. All right, now the fun stuff. We have reached the extruder section, yay. Pins again are fine for the minute. Same with micro-stepping. Rotation distance depends on the extruder you are using, specifically the gear ratio. We are using a Sherpa extruder, which uses a BMG drive gear set, but we're not using the same rotation distance as a BMG because that is set up for a different motor. The motor we're using is a NEMA 14 with a 10 tooth primary gear. What will also come into account is the number of steps that this can make and whether it is set to 16 or 32 micro stepping. So it sounds confusing, but there is actually a calculator on the Clipper website which can help you do this. Luckily, finding the correct value for rotation distance for your extruder is, is actually as simple as a Google search. Usually extruders come packaged with the same motor, with the same gear, and the values are all the same. So usually it's pretty straightforward. Next up is the nozzle and filament diameter, which is obviously pretty simple. And then we have the sensor type. Now this is normally quite straightforward because you buy a hot end, it has a specific sensor and you write in the sensor, that's it. For us, this is a little bit more complicated because we're using an A1 hot end with an A1 mini bed and Bamboo Lab don't really like to publish which sensor they use. Uh, but after a little bit of searching online, I did actually find uh, which ones are probably compatible. Uh, and I'm using those in the CFG and they seem to work. The thermistors are plugged into the main board and on main cell, I can see the temperature and it seems correct, but I can't be entirely certain until things are set up and I can heat up the bed and the hot end and make sure that those temperatures are actually correct. But for a full list of sensors, if you're doing this with your build, you can go to the Clipper website and see everything that exists there that you can put into the CFG to make your bed or your hot end thermistor compatible. Next up is control. And usually this is something called PID. And sometimes with some printers, it might be called something like watermark. Watermark works by basically turning on the power to a heater, recognizing it reaches the required temperature and then turning off the power, restoring only when it goes out of the specified range. Now, because of this, it's not very accurate. It's not good for a hot end. You need PID for this and you can't calibrate it. So for a hot end, for sure, it would be good to have PID tuning. PID is software controlled and works basically like an algorithm to decide when is the most appropriate time to turn the power on and off. And it makes sense to use because it can be calibrated. So if you have changed something with the heater on your hot end or your bed, you can recalibrate it to make it more accurate. This is something you can't do with watermark. As for min and max temp, min is fine at zero. Max temperature of the A1 hot end is 300, so we're adding that. Scrolling down to heater underscore bed, we have similar settings. You can keep watermark here if you wish, as the bed temperature accuracy is not as crucial as a hot end temperature, but PID is probably better. Max temp for the A1 mini heated bed we're using is 80 degrees only. Yeah, we're just printing PLA with this guy for the minute. And also for the minute, we can keep the fan definitions as they are. We'll get to them when necessary. MCU serial is already defined. We did that in the last video. For the printer section, our kinematics are Core XY. 
Max velocity and acceleration are not important right now. This is simply a max value. Whatever we choose in the settings of the slicer will be used provided it doesn't go over this value. And we're basically done and we can do a motion test now. Hurrah! We actually had one issue with the CFG and that was with the end stop on the Z motor. It was constantly triggered. We did an end stop check as shown here and it was triggered even when open. Easy peasy fix though, just go to the CFG and add that exclamation point before the end stop pin to invert the pins. Save and restart and query end stops once more. To test the motors, we ran an XY home command to see if everything is running correctly. And success, it is. Next time we'll be adding the print head and actually doing a printing test with an actual print, a model. There's going to be extrusion. As always, guys, let us know what you want to see in this printer in future. And if you want to talk about it, you can do so on our Discord server, where there is talk about printers on a daily basis. The link is down below, and we'll see you guys next time. Later. Later.